Heyerdahl is determined to try again. And this time, in order to find his shipwrights, he goes to Lake Titicaca, where there have been reed boats with sails from time immemorial. Reed boats are still being built here better than anywhere else in modern times. These boats are astonishingly similar to ancient Egyptian boats, for they have raised sterns as well as raised prows. Two fat reed bundles lashed together with a continuous spiral rope form the main hull of the vessel. Squeezed in between the two is a third smaller bundle wedged into the lashings and disappearing as the main rope is pulled tighter. Such South American boats are astonishingly similar to those once built 5,000 years ago in ancient Egypt. Santiago Genovese visited these Aymara Indians to find boat builders willing to come with us to Morocco in Africa and help to build Ra too. Four Indians agreed to come together with a Bolivian interpreter. They expected to find Africa on the other side of their own lake. They must believe a magic carpet has flown them to Safi in Morocco in a matter of hours. From this ancient Phoenician port, Thor Heyerdahl has sailed the previous year. Now he wants the Indians to build Ra Tu from 12 tons of papyrus reeds he has transported from Lake Tana in Ethiopia. They find these reeds are even bigger and better than their own on Lake Titicaca. They rope thousands of reeds together into two huge bundles. Each bundle is lashed independently, using only a single spiral rope, and as normal with them, a central bundle disappears from sight as the long ropes are pulled tight. A further bundle is added on top to each side to make a wider deck. After six weeks' work, Ra too is nearing completion. The Indians from Lake Titicaca are so eager to rejoin their families that they use only two-thirds of the available reeds. The boat they make is much smaller than Ra One, ten feet shorter, in fact, with far less volume than Hyadol has intended. Ra Two is first launched in dry land and is navigated through the streets of Safi by Norman Baker, the expedition pilot. A ship like something out of ancient Egypt, but built by South American Indians. The wife of the local Pasha baptizes Ra Tu in goat's milk. Hyadal's hopes are high, but he still has the bitter memory of his previous boat having failed. Under the flag of the United Nations, Ra Tu slides down the slipway, dry as blotting paper. She floated like a paper swan on top of the waves. After 10 days in the harbor, we left port and sailed into the open Atlantic, heavily loaded with six tons of cargo and superstructure. For two days, we drove southwards along the African coast with good wind and high speed. We made an average of four knots, doing 95 nautical miles in 24 hours. 
Although we were immensely pleased with our speed, we soon had another serious problem to worry about. Ra 2 started sinking much faster than Ra 1. Our new ship seemed to be too small for the many tons of cargo she carried. The heavy load pressed us deeper and deeper into the water. While we clipped ourselves fast with lifelines so as not to fall overboard ourselves, we started to throw away anything not desperately needed. Our papyrus lifeboat went first. Santiago, our quartermaster like last time, went carefully through his inventory to find anything we could dump. to help. The sinking stopped. We continued our voyage in the direction of distant America, due west. They are still in the coastal shipping lanes. After dark, their tiny paraffin lamps are hard to see from busy modern ships. The night watch plays his flashlight against their sail, hopefully to give a better warning. After two days and nights of excellent sailing, they suddenly come to a stop. They are becalmed. And they still have an enormous distance to go to America most of which they have covered the year before. As we woke up the third morning, the wind had died away. Our sail was no longer filled, and we found ourselves drifting helplessly to and fro without any visible progress. To film ourselves from the outside, we had a small rubber dinghy with room for two or three men. In the calm water, it was easy to observe small black clots of solidified oil. We had discovered the previous year endless quantities of oil lamps drifting about in the Atlantic Ocean, and the samples we delivered to the United Nations then caused such wide interest that we decided this time to undertake a systematic daily investigation. The lamps were black and soft like tar or asphalt. We saw them every day and sometimes they carried passengers of various kinds. In this case, a tiny crab. Day after day, no wind, no progress, only slow sinking on the same spot. To keep spirits high, even a university professor is willing to turn clown. Mexico and Egypt on the stage. As they drift aimlessly in the current between the Canary Islands and the coast of the Sahara, birds of many kinds fly by and frequently settle on board. They are fed and cared for, and Ra too begins to look like a floating aviary. Even a whale joins them, but is not close enough to have a decent portrait taken.
Among the birds was a ring-marked pigeon from Spain. We added another message to its foot. Stopped on the route 2, 21st of May. Refusing to return to land like the other birds, the dove chose to stay with us as a symbol of the multinational expedition right across the Atlantic Ocean. Familiar birds from northern lands, like old friends to Hyadar, pay visits to Ra too, and so do more exotic birds from the tropics. They seem to think the bundle boat is their nest. Without wind, it seems pointless to keep on steering, so they leave the rudder oars to take care of themselves. Instead, they begin swimming to tidy up the reeds below, and Surial, the frogman, uses his underwater camera. They make a disturbing discovery. With two little papyrus to carry too much cargo, more than half of the reed boat has been pressed below the surface, but as far as they can judge, the sinking appears to have stopped. Others arrive to make an inspection, including this grouper. I was anxious myself to inspect the papyrus from underneath and even more so the extremely thin rope which the Indians had insisted on using, claiming that the pressure would be evenly distributed along the continuous spiral. I found everything in perfect order. Their floating aquarium includes a number of striped pilot fish, usually the hangers-on of sharks. They seem just as willing to attach themselves to Ra. Jellyfish and other members of that family drift by. In one area particularly polluted with oil, thousands of them are floating about, dead. Even when we swam in clean water, small clots of oil often had to be brushed aside with our hands. Safi, the monkey, is just as fed up with the drifting as anybody else. They even resort to rowing. as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. Finally, the wind returned, and we moved so fast that the life boy had to be trailed behind on a rope as a safety precaution in case anybody fell overboard. It would be a last chance. We could not stop or turn back. 
we lived in intimate contact with the ocean. That is why we detected the pollution not visible from a big ship. From now on, all bathing had to be done inside a net. We were eight men from eight countries sleeping in the same basket. A Russian next to an American, an Arab from Egypt next to a Jew. There was ample fuel on board for a serious conflagration. Our paper boat was loaded with psychological petrol and the heat generated by friction could only be extinguished by the endless waves. Every day, Hayadal records experiences which make him understand the problems involved in ancient reed boat navigation. The nearest land is hidden in mist, but according to Baker, they must have just passed the Canary Islands. That is one map they won't need again. This time, like last, they carry food and water exactly as they had seen the ancient Egyptians do on the bar reliefs in the tombs of the pharaohs. Some of their water is kept in goatskin bags, but much of it in big earthenware jars, as is most of their food. Almonds. Hard-baked bread, as in pharaoh's Egypt. Raisins. different kinds of nuts, dates and various dried fruits, cello, an ancient African expedition diet made from honey, ground nuts, flour and other nourishing ingredients, eggs preserved in lime and water, Butter, salted and boiled in Berber fashion. They have plenty of ingredients to cook some delicious meals on their little paraffin stove. We represented eight different languages, but generally managed to communicate in English, French or Italian. I was really happy with my multinational companions. There are eight men instead of seven on the Ra Tu voyage. All of the original crew are on board except Abdullah of Chad, Africa, who could not come. Instead, they have along Madani Ait Uhani from Morocco, a hotel manager. Oh, you slob. Anyone who drinks soup from a cup with two hands has got to... And in addition to him, a Japanese cameraman, Kei Ohara, who has never sailed an ocean and who cooks oriental dishes when he isn't taking pictures. Every day, they collect samples of oil pollution. A few times, the entire ocean surface is covered with lumps floating about in dirty gray water like that in a city sewer. But usually, the lumps are bobbing about far apart in what otherwise appears to be clean water. They vary in size from a grain of wheat to a large potato. Some are completely covered with barnacles and other mollusks. The pollution is obviously affecting the life of marine creatures all over the ocean. They find that modern men have succeeded in polluting the Atlantic Ocean all the way from Africa to America.
fish are scared away from modern ships, but not from quietly floating papyrus bundles. They join the Ra expedition. Normally, the mariners leave the fish in peace, but sometimes they drop a fishing line out of longing for fresh varieties as a change from dried fish or Egyptian fish roll. One day, the crew members are shocked by a shout of man overboard. Surial has taken a careless step and is soon left behind in the waves. Fortunately, the trailing lifeline saves him. But for that line, he would eventually have drowned. There is no way of turning back the ship. Hyadol constantly has fears that the monkey will go overboard too, for she sometimes escapes from her lifeline and scuttles up the rigging, refusing to come down no matter how tempting the tidbits they offer. Yuri goes up the mast after her, but with no success, until he gets the idea of using Safi's pet toy as a lure, an ugly, squeaking rubber frog which she won't allow anyone else to play with. Though they are sailing through the tropics, the cooling breezes go through the wickerwork walls of their bamboo cabin. Baker calculates they are averaging 60 nautical miles a day, or more than 100 kilometers. June 15th. A month has passed. Africa is far, far behind, and the crew, going? with singing, celebrates having reached the halfway point of the voyage. De donde crece la palma, la palma. Yo soy un hombre sincero, sincero. De donde crece la palma, antes de morir me quiero echar mis besos de la alma. Guantanamera, hey, hey. Guajira, Guantanamera. We got used to the ocean, and the cameramen sometimes ventured far away from our safe papyrus bundles. But one day the wind increased and the waves started to rise so high that I called Carlo and George's back for fear that the real gale was approaching.
The waves came chasing from behind. Bedra rolled like a seabird. She tipped her tail up and let them pass under. And the giant wave turned her sideways, and sliding down, she broke her rudder. and two nights we struggled helplessly without any kind of steering control, taking all the waves over us sideways. The sail must come down. The wind catching it is wrenching the boat around to port, but at the same time the sail, if lowered, might be shredded or carried overboard by the waves. The situation is dangerous. They work anxiously and cautiously lest they capsize. Taking a leaf from the ancient Egyptian war books, they have fastened a security rope to the rudder oar blade. So at least the broken section is trailing behind and can be saved. The powerful waves snap the tree trunk like a toothpick. Oh, we're turning again. Okay, just a minute. And now they're in a desperate quandary. In the early days of calm, they threw all heavy wood overboard so that they wouldn't sink. Now they have no spar left to splice the broken log. They make a scale model of the shattered parts to see whether any of the fragments can span the long gap from the empty fork at sea level up to the steering bridge. They tie the rudder blade to the longest fragment of the handle, using ropes to give flexibility. In any case, they do not have a nail or screw in the entire boat. Push it in. George, it is not coming down. Can you pull your starboard preventer? They get back on course again. Ra raises her tail to the waves and rides along with the trade winds towards America. The broken rudder oar is working once more, but the other one is jammed in the twisted fork and has to be chiseled free by the Japanese K. At last, the vessel is under full control, and they are able to hoist all sail. But with one oar broken and stunted, steering has become terribly complicated. The tiller of the unbroken starboard rudder can still be reached with the right hand, but the short fragment of the broken port side oar has to be pulled one way with a long bamboo rod and the other way by stepping on a rope because the stunted shaft doesn't reach further than floor level. And there is still half the Atlantic to go. Our deck had been pressed right down to sea level as all our papyrus had become soaked from above as well as from below. The water which had tumbled over us unprotected sides in the days we drifted sideways without steering control had been absorbed above the water line. This added weight pressed even our upper side rolls partly underwater. 
We were riding terribly low. Yet we were tremendously impressed to find that not a single papyrus reed had broken or come loose, and our thin spiral rope was entirely undamaged after the battle with the seas. Flexibility and toughness of reeds and ropes had saved our lives, whereas we had seen giant timber loose in the battle with the ocean. To get some sort of shelter from the waves, they cut up their spare sail. Strips of canvas help protect them from breaking seas. To simplify the cumbersome steering, Hyadal suggests tilting the mast forward. This brings a sail right up into the bow. Because the sail is so far forward, it tangles with the papyrus bow, which they have to hack off. But with the sail pulling in front of the ship, they find it easy to keep their stern against the wind and waves. This is all that is needed to keep them on course, because the trade winds at their back always blow towards America. You see them? They learn one day from their radio receiver that a United Nations research vessel is trying to find them. Ah, there they are. Right dead astern. I really see them. They're coming right dead smack behind us astern. Do you see them, Tommy? Huh? Look, look, dead astern. Oh, yes, I see it. Right. Yes, yes, yes. I don't understand that. I thought that was last year. It is the Kalamar from the West Indies. Next morning, the Kalamar has been lost far behind. She has turned off her engines, but has drifted much more slowly than Ra. Hey, could you 
When she does catch up again, she stays for two days to study marine life that has gathered under the quietly drifting reed boat. After two days, the Calamar leaves them for her home port and disappears in the direction of the Caribbean. The perked up papyrus stern acts as an extra sail, and to get a better balance to the ship, they decided to saw the stern off as well. But in slicing off a piece of their ship fore and aft, they also sever the long spiral rope, binding the whole ship together. Fortunately, the wet papyrus has swollen so grossly that the rope is squeezed hard and can't be pulled out, even by force. By this time, they have entered the area east of the West Indies, where nearly all American hurricanes are born, with the hurricane season expected to begin at any time. could also confirm that the islands were very near and that we had entered American shipping lanes. We were lucky to escape any hurricane. Our deck had remained at sea level the whole of the last month, but we were not sinking any further. Then one day Barbados Island was so near that the government boat, the Culpeper, was sent out to welcome us. The Culpeper followed along on our last leg towards Barbados. We expected to see it any moment. sooner had we sighted land than a number of small boats came out to welcome us. Now we were so near that houses could be seen ashore, and we sailed westward along the island towards the capital, Bridgetown. Outside the port of Bridgetown, the sail of Ra, with its symbol of the sun, went on for the last time, and the Culpeper towed us through the traffic into port.
They are given a great welcome by the people of Barbados, the Prime Minister, and an American delegation from the Knights of Malta. This time, Heyerdahl has reached his goal. After 57 days, his paper boat, Ra 2, has sailed more than 3,000 nautical miles right across the Atlantic. In dock, they can see that Ra 2 is virtually undamaged, except for the bow and stern, which they themselves have sawn off. The bottom is completely covered with barnacles from the long voyage. Scarcely one reed is broken or loose, although they have absorbed water to their maximum capacity. The flexible reeds have proven to be more resistant to the beatings of the ocean than the strong, rigid timbers. The voyage of Ra had proved that the papyrus boat neither sinks nor disintegrates on a voyage into the open ocean. It had also proved that it was possible for men to live together in peace even under stress and difficult conditions and irrespective of nationality, skin color, political background or religious beliefs as long as they cooperate for common survival. Contrary to all scientific opinions, it was perfectly possible to cross the Atlantic in an ancient type of reed boat. In studying the origins of pre-Columbian civilization in ancient America, science must, in the future, take into account the fact that it is possible that some ideas, some inspiration, might have reached the Indians of tropical America long before the dawn of written history. <laughs>